on the phone. Dahlia Lithwick, Slate's senior editor, writing uh, for the New Republic, Yale, Harvard, Yale, Harvard, Yale, Harvard, 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 Columbia, the thing that scares me most about the Supreme Court. Welcome to the program, Dahlia. Hi there, Sam. Thanks for having me. Now, uh, that sounds like every parent's uh, dream. (laughs) Right? I mean... (laughs) Yale, Harvard, Yale, Harvard, Yale, Harvard, 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 Columbia. Uh, why should that scare us about the Supreme Court? Well, the, the title focuses on one piece of uh, a longer kind of critique that is just about the lack of diversity at the court. So there's nothing intrinsically wrong with Yale or Harvard or Columbia. They're all great schools. But I think the piece was trying to focus on just the complete and utter lack of meaningful diversity amongst the justices and the ways in which this court, the current Roberts Court, is singularly lacking in diversity, not just of educational background, but employment background, even geographic diversity, uh, that, you know, the, the Supreme Court for most of American history had just strange arrays of elected representatives and people who had been ambassadors and people who had served in the military and then all these interesting things and that it's a little bit of a tragic byproduct of our current confirmation system that the only folks who can get confirmed anymore look more and more alike. Now, is it, I mean, but that's not the problem in and of itself. In other words... What is uh, that that creates a problem is your argument? What, tell us what that problem is. Well, I think that the narrowing of experience has led to a kind of what I, what I call in the piece the, the rise of the judicial thoroughbred. You know, somebody who is unbelievably smart, unbelievably accomplished, um, you know, has the most stellar academic and professional credentials in this very, very narrow bandwidth. And it creates a, a lack of space for a lot of other kinds of experience, other kinds of thinking. Uh, one of the things I really focus on in the piece is the demise of really empathy for people who um, look more and more unfamiliar to the justices. And so the example I give, Sam, is just that when Thurgood Marshall used to talk in conference and used to say to his colleagues, all of whom were, you know, sort of equally smart and interesting, but came from very, very different backgrounds. And he used to say, stop, stop, stop. You know, this is what it was like to be black in the Jim Crow South. People would stop and they would listen and they would credit that with a certain amount of truth. And I contrast that in the piece to Sonia Sotomayor trying to do the same thing last year in an affirmative action case where she says, in an equally heartfelt way to her colleagues, stop, 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 this is what it is to be a Latina in America today and to be all but shut down by her colleagues because there's no place anymore for talking about diversity of experience or how uh, we all come from very different places. Now there's just this machine that grinds out hundreds and hundreds of pages of very scholarly, very brilliant opinions, but less and less space for anything that looks like a diverse life experience. But is this a is this a function of the lack of diversity, or is this because we now have a five-person block of a dominant ideology that is it even goes beyond ideology in some sense, but there, these are, you know, at least three or four of them are basically movement people, right? I mean, these people who came through a, a system sort of developed, I guess, by the Federalist Society to make sure that this was their perspective. And so when they drown out Sotomayor's experience, it's not because they have a problem with experience. They have a problem with her experience. I I think there's some truth to that. And one of the things that I do talk about is the kind of rise of the judicial industrial complex, you know, these these groups on uh, both sides that do such a thorough vetting that you will never, ever again get 
uh, sort of a hapless, interesting uh, death penalty lawyer. You know, uh, I think nobody has been in, as clear about this as the Chief Justice, who has said we couldn't get a Scalia or a Ginsburg confirmed in the current climate. So I think that part of it is that just generally the system is a little bit rigged now to the point that almost no one who's ever written or said anything interesting or controversial could ever be confirmed. And the proxy for for all of that is judicial experience, right? So almost every single person on the current court comes off the bench. But I think you're quite right that the court has uh, moved farther and farther and farther to the right. You know, studies show that this is the most conservative court we've seen in 100 years and that four of the most conservative, 10 most conservative justices in the past uh, century are seated now on the court. So there's no disputing that this is a movement court. I think one of the things that's interesting is why the left wing of the court doesn't sort of answer that. So you don't see on the left wing, you know, the, the sort of rabid, bomb-throwing left wingers. There's no Brennans, there's no Marshalls. Uh, and so I think that there is uh, an interesting problem on the court of a lack of parity between the kind of movements that push folks onto the court and why we don't see a similar movement on the left. What also strikes me in your piece, and I did not know this, but a, uh, the, you wrote a study released in February showed that 71 percent of Obama's nominees, this is, uh, of course, you're talking about all federal judi- uh, judicial uh, posts. Correct. 71 percent had practiced primarily for corporate or business clients. I mean, you know, it, it almost at one point we start to say, like, you know, we talk about the liberals, the left and the right on the court. But really what we're talking about is there seems to be missing like we have moved. I, I don't know how to express this. We've moved the markers so much uh, to the the right in some respects that we don't even have room to say that or that we say that the left constitutes 71 percent of people who 71 uh, percent of whom have worked for corporate attorneys. In other words, the left doesn't seem so left to me in this regard. Well, I think that that's reflective of a larger, right? This is this is the conversation the left is having post midterm elections is, is, is what is the left and is the left torquing to the right to accommodate the right as it moves, you know, more extremely to the right? Or is the left the kind of Elizabeth Warren uh, Creed occur left that wants to uh, reset where the center is? And, and, and that I just think that we see that reflected in the court, and we shouldn't be surprised about that. I think that Adam Liptak at the New York Times has done really interesting research into the ways that the court is as ideologically fractured left-right as the country is and as the Congress is, and that we, for a very, very long time, had a lot more back and forth between the right and the left. You know, conservative justices used to hire liberal clerks. Liberal justices used to hire conservative clerks. Uh, That's almost completely gone. And so I think part of it is, as you say, you know, what does it mean to be on the left wing of the court anymore? And part of it really is that in a country that is as fractured and polarized, why should we be surprised that the court is similarly fractured and polarized and talking beyond each other in case after case? You can just look at last year's Hobby Lobby as emblematic of, you know, a right wing and a left wing and a court that literally don't even know what the other side is talking about. Right. I mean, I think it's most pronounced on on social issues, although, you know, uh, there's, you know, this uh, the this case, the, the, the King versus Burwell, I think, is a sort of a a good example of just sort of, I don't even know how you bring, I mean, you really, it's just these movement players who don't like this law uh, versus everybody else in some respect. That's right. And I think anybody who's written about King and Halbig, the, the two challenges to the Obamacare that are have just been granted by the court, uh, really are saying all eyes are on Chief Justice Robert. You know, is Robert's going to do what he did in the first ACA case and side with the liberal wing of the court to preserve the core of the law, even while the Medicaid uh, expansion uh, gets uh, 
sort of suffers for that, or is he going to vote with his uh, more conservative colleagues to just in effect, eviscerate the purposes of the law. And we don't really know. We know that Roberts has said, pointedly said, several times this year that he doesn't want the court to be seen as ideological, that it worries him enormously when the court is viewed as the sum of their, uh, who they voted for in the last election. But I think that he's trying to stem a tide that feels really inexorable. This court has really split apart, as you said, not just on social issues, but a lot of these issues that have to do with, you know, business prevailing or the rights of workers um, being diminished. So I think we are seeing that chasm and it worries the just, the chief justice, I think, because he really feels that he has inherited this mantle from Rehnquist before him and other chief justices that he admires to paint the court as something that transcends ideology. And I think, Sam, that's, again, what brings me back to the piece about why diversity matters at the court. And no less a person than Clarence Thomas just two weeks ago at an event at Yale said it's just hugely problematic that everyone in the court graduated from two law schools. So right. even Justice Thomas feels that when the court looks like it's not responsive to what the rest of us are experiencing, it really does create that illusion that Roberts is worried about, that the court is out of touch. I mean, how much do you think, how much, how sincere is that? I mean, when Thomas and Roberts say, yeah, you know, we really bemoan the fact that we look out of touch. Incidentally, uh, we're going to strike down the Voting Rights Act uh, and uh, say that uh, the Senate was just too afraid to do it themselves. Um, I mean, how much are they sort of saying, like, we're going to, we really need to do a better job of window dressing versus, uh, you know, to, to uh, further our agenda? I mean, how sincere are they when they say that? Because it's easy for them to say that, right? Like, I mean, there's no skin off their, net, their backs at that point. They're already on the court. And, uh, you know, the, this just puts pressure on President Obama. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the the truth of it, one of, one of my favorite books, Sam, and this is just the nut of it that you've hit on, is that the justices do want to be above the fray. They do deeply believe in their hearts of hearts that they transcend everyday politics, that what they're doing is a lot closer to the kind of oracular work of divining what the Constitution says. And I think, and this transcends ideology, by the way, I think from the right to the left, the justices really want to be on understood as doing something fundamentally different from, you know, bare knuckle politics. And at the same time, they're political. They just are. And one of my favorite books is called uh, All Justices uh, Are Political Except for When They're Not. And I think it really captures uh, this idea that, of course, they're political. And, of course, an awful lot of the time, they nevertheless decide cases 9-0 and 8-1. And you just have to do the work of, and they have to do the work of holding those two ideas in your head, even though it fits uncomfortably, that this is quite a partisan political branch that often gets beyond that. And I think that when the Chief Justice or Justice Thomas or uh, Justice Kennedy or uh, Justice Breyer, most family, famously, he's written books about this, worry about the public perception that the justices are just political hacks. I think that's a legitimate worry because they don't think they are just political hacks, even though sometimes they act politically. Oh, oh, no, I think it's a legitimate worry, and I think that they're sincere about it, but that doesn't mean that they aren't going to act that way. Do you know what I mean? Like, you oh, know, I agree. Uh, I agree. I want people to perceive me as a, uh, an esteemed uh, journalist. It's very, very important to me. But, you know, I still, um, I'm still going to do uh, a piece on Gamergate because it may get uh, YouTube hits. I'm not saying I do that, but, I'm, but that's, the, <laughs> that's, the, that's the dilemma. And I guess, you know, like, w let me ask you this because I do want to get back um, uh, to, to, to the focus of your piece. But on this uh, King Burwell uh, 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 case, do you think those four justices, and we don't know who those four justices are, but we can probably guess, um, do you think those four justices think they have Roberts this time, or do you think that they're taking this case just to put pressure on Roberts, or, I mean, surely this doesn't just happen, and Roberts gets a phone call uh, from his clerk and says, 
Those guys just, you know, when they said they were going out for lunch, they ended up uh, giving uh, certification to uh, King versus Burwell. And he's just like, ah, those guys. I mean, is there like conversations that go? I mean, how does that happen? Well, two things. One is I think it's, it's incredibly important to emphasize that we just don't know which four justices voted to grant cert. And I've seen pretty reliable arguments uh, suggesting that, for instance, someone like Justice Breyer might have voted with some block of conservatives uh, to uh, grant cert simply because you do have what looks like it's a split between uh, circuit courts of appeal, even though the D.C. Circuit withdrew its opinion, that it's simply a matter of such pressing, exigent need to get this worked out that the states literally can't function until this is answered, that there's some urgency even absent a circuit split, and there's kind of a sort of a circuit split anyway. And so we don't know who um, voted to take Dalla, it. Do you in- believe that, though? I mean, do you really think that there was that all of those factors exist? I mean, we don't really have a split, right? We might after uh, the full court hears it in, in, the, in the First Circuit, but... What is so pressing? I mean, what is so pressing at the state level right now? It's working. Well, I think the states would argue that they simply need to know if federal exchanges, you know, don't count as exchanges for purposes of the statute. I think the argument is the states simply need to know that, that for the, you know, just the purpose of planning out what's coming, it's useful to know it. And and I would also say, um, you know, incredible though it sounds, I was one of the people urging the court to take the same-sex marriage cases in October, even when there was no circuit split, because I think there are people whose lives are on hold until this gets resolved. So it's certainly, it well, is not... That's, that, in that case, I think there's, there's something to be said there, but there's nobody going around who can show some type of material problem that they're not, that they're getting subsidies, right? Right. I mean, and that's even a question in the cases is this standing question of who is really being harmed. But I think that's separate from the problem of the state simply need to know going forward what's going to happen. And there, there's, you know, I think there's at least a plausible argument that there were justices who felt that this is, this case is of such an order of magnitude that it needs to be taken. But just to your other point about where the chief justice is, you know, I've certainly seen John you wrote a piece urging the chief justice to vote with the conservatives in this case because it would sort of redeem him from his great uh, disgrace in voting against them in the last round. Right. Uh, there's been there's certainly some pressure, and I think it's so interesting. I mean, really, one of the questions that is so interesting is the extent to which these conversations that happen in the media have any effect on the chief justices. You probably remember when John Roberts allegedly switched his vote between oral argument and the final decision in the first round of Obamacare cases. There was an enormous groundswell of complaint that liberal journalists had shamed him into doing that, right? That there was all of these progressive journalists who were saying, oh, this is your legacy and you're going to have to live with striking down Obamacare forever. And that's what led the chief to switch his vote. I always found that kind of laughable, but I think we're really? seeing a... Well, Maybe, now, I don't know if I'm telling you something new, Dahlia, but I don't know if you saw what CNN put out today. Oh, I saw it. <laughs> I mean, uh, let me, let me uh, you know, because... You may not have, uh, you know, uh, the, the question as to whether or not um, uh, Roberts is shamed by liberal uh, columnists. Uh, at the very least, we know uh, as of today that Sam Alito uh, has a problem with you <laughs> and your piece that you wrote. According to CNN, I was reading one. I'm going to quote apparently from his uh, from a, uh, a public lecture he gave that was moderated. Uh, CNN says, Alito took particular issue with the New Republic column critical of the cloistered culture of the court. I was reading one, actually, reading one this morning, and was complaining about the current membership of the court because unlike the past days, according to this columnist, we don't have a representation of drunks, philanderers, and a few, you know, fewer other ne'er-do-wells. Now, you did write something like that, but it wasn't a complaint that there weren't enough drunks and philanderers on the court. So (laughs) it suggests to me that Sam Alito got a little bit, this got under his skin a little bit, so much so that he wanted to go out in public and actually misrepresent what you wrote. Right. 
Is there a question there, Sam? Well, I mean, come on, Dahlia. You can't say that it's far-fetched that maybe uh, John Roberts is reading his critique uh, if we know Sam Alito is and is so burned up by it by the next, let's just assume, let's just pretend it wasn't you, uh, that that moments later he's got to talk about it in public and misrepresent the piece. I, I think a couple things. One, I'm really grateful that the CNN uh, piece actually says, wow, he, you know, that's not what the piece said. So I'm, I'm thankful that, um, you know, he, he, he uh, didn't get to assert that I want more drunks on the court. Um, <laughs> although, you know, drunk. Junks are funny. Uh, but I think that, you know, what's interesting is that I think there's a, a lot of space between the claim that the justices are incredibly sensitive about how they are personally represented. I mean, that's a long standing. You know, I, I have quotes from every one of the justices complaining about how the press covers them. And that's different from saying that the justices, particularly the chief in Obamacare, would conform his vote to some liberal elite uh, journalistic standard. And there was for a long time uh, in the liberal academy and the conservative academy, there was this word called the greenhouse effect, and it had nothing to do with carbon emissions. It just had to do with the idea that justices would conform their votes to please Linda Greenhouse, the Pulitzer Prize winning New York Time journalist. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that when, when Linda retired and Adam Liptak uh, took her place, uh, we heard less of that. But I think that the notion that justices uh, vote according to one columnist or other seems to me far-fetched, which is very, very different from the justices get hot and bothered when they are personally criticized. I think the latter is, you know, one of the great paradoxes of the Supreme Court is that it is very, very uh, protective of the idea of the press, but not always protective of the particulars of the press. And that's as it, as it, you know, the nature of, you know, an institution that locks out cameras. But I think it's, it's what you're saying is that that kind of can slur over into how they actually vote in a case. And that I find, you know, I suppose it's plausible, but I don't think that a column by Jeff Rosen about Chief Justice John Roberts single-handedly allowed John Roberts to change his vote in that Obamacare case. I just don't, I'm not sure. That right, but I think there is, much. I mean, I think on one hand, if he is concerned about his perception uh, and, and you know, the, the justice is concerned about the perception of the court, and clearly, I mean, look, you didn't single out Sam Alito in this piece at all. I mean, you were talking about a, a broader trend that you find problematic, and he clearly took offense to it. Um, the uh, <clears throat> the idea that if Roberts is genuinely sensitive to this, uh, this notion that uh, the court is going to be perceived as simply uh, a, a group of partisan hacks, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't. I, I think there's some there's some distance between just one column. Uh, say, oh, this is the way I'm going to vote versus like, wow, the totality seems to be I would be completely out of the mainstream to do this. Um, I mean, frankly, I, I, I think had there been as much focus on the implications of of not of basically gutting the Voting Rights Act, um, uh, it would be interesting to see if that would have had any implications in terms of the way they voted. I mean, but that, that King Burwell case uh, disturbs me in the same way that the Voting Rights Act did is because there is an option there where they can, pers they can be seen as simply deferring, even though they are usurping, but they can be seen as deferring to Congress, right? Because in the Voting Rights Act, they said, well, the, uh, when the Senate and the House reauthorized the Voting Rights Act, they didn't really have the courage to uh, open it up and do the fixing that they needed to do. We're now not going to gut the Voting Rights Act. We're just simply going to put it back on Congress and say, you guys fix this. You can fix it. It's up to you. You could do it in a day. They could, they could do the same thing in this King versus Burwell and get away with basically saying, we didn't really do anything. We just basically sent it back to Congress, and then the will of the people decided not to fix it. 
That's right. And I think that if you look at the way the Roberts Court has operated, it's not just a matter of sort of purported deference to one branch or another. And it's always that, you know, we're going to respect Congress. Oh, we're going to, you know, respect the state legislature. Oh, we're going to respect, you know, the, the, the town of Greece in upstate New York. We're going to just respect the town council when they say they want uh, sectarian prayer. So there's always this appearance of deference while they do what they do. But I think the other thing underlying what you're saying that's really interesting about how the Roberts Court does things is there's always a little case and then a big case. And so there's generally a case that tees up what's going to happen in Citizens United. There's a case that tees up uh, what's going to happen in the voting rights case. There's just, you know, always a case where uh, something much, much, much more dramatic could have happened and didn't happen, and it looks like, oh, okay, well, that that didn't happen. But then you look down the road two, three years, and there's a big case. So I think it's it's both an act of deference and also an act of doing it incrementally. And the Roberts Court is really, really good at moving to the right incrementally. And I think, you know, your underlying point is absolutely the right point, which is we at the press don't always do a terrific job of explaining in advance of each of these cases, this is what's going to happen if, you know, a section of the voting rights is eviscerated today. We don't always do a good exam, a good job three years later saying, wow, this is what happened in that Seattle school's uh, opinion, you know, when we got rid of uh, voluntary uh, programs to try to desegregate schools that had self-segregated. So we don't always do a good job of both projecting forward in time what's going to happen and then looking back over years and years and saying, holy cow, let's revisit you know, this case. And I think as a consequence, because we, we sometimes cover the court, and this is not you know, in any way to single out any of my colleagues, but I think we don't always cover it as something that happens over years and years. We cover it as something that happens over days in a term. Right. So then we, we fail to say, wow, look at what happened. Look at the fallout from something that happened three years ago that may have looked like it wasn't a big deal. Yeah, no, I mean, and I, it's it, it's a tough beat in many respects because you, you're you're basically writing like, wow, uh, this could be semi-apocalyptic or nothing, and uh, we won't know until this day in June or whatever it is. Um, but uh, do you think that the the problems that you outline in your piece, essentially, that there is such a narrow now sort of pinhole? Uh, in which uh, one has to pass through to become confirmed as a justice. And the, the right certainly has done, or done a better job in sort of creating, they have built a machine that actually basically just pops out uh, these movement conservatives who are perfectly shaped for that pinhole. Um, but does this basically uh, reveal that there may be a broader problem sort of a structural problem with the court, like something problematic in the institution as a whole. I mean, I have found it, I've had a very tough time with the court since 2000, uh, frankly. And, you know, I, it seems to me that um, there's a lot more, I don't know, uh, there's a vestige. There's just seems to be a lot of uh, baggage around the court that, um, it could, in my my opinion, sort of hide some central truth that it is really fundamentally broken. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think that, that one of the problems that we have a little bit on the left is always going to be that, you know, we like the court when it does Brown v. Board, and we don't like it uh, when it does... Uh, you know, uh, Citizens United or Hobby Lobby. And so I think that it always appears as though it's slightly opportunistic, you know, that the criticism is, oh, we only like it, um, you know, when, when they do what we like. But I, I will say, um, you know, that, that, that it seems to me that the court is by definition, and I think this is implicit in my piece, probably not explicit, just an extremely conservative institution. And it's conservative in 
almost every way. And then in addition to that, it's popped inside this DC, inside the Beltway culture that is also, I think, extremely conservative. And so what you're flagging in your question, you know, and I would commend you to Professor Erwin Chemerinsky is the dean of UCLA, and he's just written a big book about the court uh, last month in which he says the court, with very few exceptions, always errs on the side of being extremely small C conservative, extremely risk averse, uh, extremely cautious, you know, tends to lead from behind time after time. So then the bigger question is, and I think there's some real truth uh, to Chemerinsky's complaint, and then the question becomes, is that structurally useful? You know, do we want that branch of government to be, you know, what's called the least dangerous branch? Uh, do we want it to be tentative? Do we want it to be, um, to just tend to defer and defer and defer? And that's a harder question. I think Jim Rinsky would say, and his book does say, you know, when you are the branch of government that is tasked with protecting the voiceless minorities who cannot be served by the political branches, sometimes you just have to be brave. Uh, and I think that the court just by and large is not hugely brave. And I think so, to a certain extent they have been really bold, though, don't you? I mean, the Voting Rights Act decision, I thought, was incredibly bold. You get out there and you say that the Senate and the House, they reauthorized the Voting Rights Act simply because they didn't have the courage to do so, that we're going we're gonna to take the lead on that? That just seems to me to actually be exactly that, that they are, they are being extremely bold. <laughs> it's just I happen to totally disagree with their boldness. Right. No, I mean, I think that this court has been very, very brave uh, in pursuing a certain, you know, pro-business, pro-corporate, uh, pro-religion uh, agenda that doesn't dovetail with this, you know, whatever the counter-majoritarian mission was supposed to be. So I think that, you know, what I'm just describing is institutionally. So yes, I would separate your questions. A good one, the, the Chemerinsky uh, criticism in the case against the Supreme Court, his new book, which is not about the Roberts Court. It's about, and in fact, he almost doesn't talk about the Roberts Court. It's just about the institution mm. uh, and its lack of bravery from what you're describing, which is, you know, the Bush v. Gore Court and sort of successive uh, Roberts Court uh, decisions that have been incredibly brave. But I think it's it's seems to me that one of the things that at least I'm trying to say in the piece is that the more the court disaggregates itself from the daily life of the country, from criticism, from, you know, I cite justices who don't even read newspapers that they disagree with or go to conferences with people they disagree with, you know, just that growing sense that everybody in the country who doesn't agree with you is in bad faith and they're lying and they want to get you. And that, you know, I think we're just seeing that culturally. I think that everybody in Congress probably feels that way. Certainly everybody in the media feels that way. We just impute uh, ill motives and bad faith and dishonesty to anybody who doesn't agree with us. And I think when you see a court that is quite, quite persuaded that the public is kind of scary and dangerous and that there's, you know, a 200 foot buffer around the court where you can't speak, uh, you know, you can't even enter. I think, and, and I describe in the piece simply the closing of the ceremonial front doors, just as a metaphor for a court, I think that is very, very, very anxious about the public. And I guess, Sam, this goes back to one of your first questions, which is, you know, is the court anxious about the public? Should they be? Should they be immune to our criticism? Um, I don't. You know. I, I think that that institutionally, and again, this is what J J Justice Breyer writes about all the time. Uh, the court relies completely on public goodwill and public opinion. It right. It has neither the purse nor the sword. It has nothing to protect it other than the public belief that it's generally doing the right thing. And so I think all this anxiety about criticism, there's some sense in which the institution can't survive if we just pick up our flaming torches and go after them. And so I think they live, they really do. And I have to 
honor it to some degree institutionally. They live right on the seam between trying to appear legitimate and trying to push forward an agenda that is not necessarily what a constitutional court does. And I think they're always balancing that and always recalibrating that line. And I think that's why criticism, you know, even my piece, which, like I say, contains almost nothing that Justice Thomas hadn't said himself at Yale a few days uh, earlier. But I think that that criticism, when it suggests that the court is a dangerous uh, branch of government, I think that makes the justices very nervous. They see it as having very real consequences. Apparently, according to <laughs> Sam Alito. Now, to be fair, um, you know, he may just take issue with the fact that um, you're not a man and you wrote that. But I'm not going to make <laughs> you comment on that at all. <laughs> Dahlia. <laughs> I, I'm just going to sit with that for a little while. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just spitballing as to what uh, Lido <laughs> might have a problem with. Um, but uh, you know, it's interesting because I, the one of the only quotes I think I can ever remember is uh, one by Justin Learned Hand, and and I'm paraphrasing, but it was something to the effect of the side of liberty is the side that's not quite sure it's right. That seems like fantasy land in terms of uh, this court. Yeah, you know, I, I, I like that. I, I, I don't know the quote. I like it, and um, I'm going to look it up. But I think that one of the things that I really noticed last term, and I don't think I'd ever noticed this before, Sam, was the extent to which the justices on each side of the ideological divide started calling each other blind. Um, and the accusation in case after case was that, like, how can you not see what I see? And I thought it was interesting. I, I wrote a piece about it in the spring that I have completely repressed, so I can't quote from it. But I thought it was such an interesting metaphor, this idea that, like, oh, my God, the truth is so obvious. Why are you blind to it? And that justice after justice on one side or the other used the language of blindness because it implies such certainty that what you see is right and what the other side you know their failure to see it means that they're impaired and I think that one of and I haven't really thought this through but it dovetails nicely with um, what I wrote in the New Republic article is that I think that there is a part of this court that is so smart and so intellectually gifted and able to spin out hundreds of words of opinions with more footnotes than we've ever seen before that allows you to be that certain that you're right and that certain that the other side is blind and that also I think it's of a piece with the article I wrote that is just that there again seems to be very very little space for self-doubt or for self criticism uh it just feels as though uh i'm right you're wrong also you're lying well and that that's a worry that gets back to your to your headline to a certain extent because we you know with all due respect i think you know of to the extent that there are any higher uh, institutions of learning that pump out people who are convinced that they are right and everyone else is wrong, <laughs> I would say Harvard and Yale and maybe Columbia are, you know, those, those are the ones that come to the, 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 the top of the list. That and Connecticut College, I got to say. <laughs> But um, all right, so so lastly, do you think that th that writing and that's fascinating? It's also sort of ironic in that justice is supposed to be blind, right? But right. Um, do you think that they that they they are writing more like that because they are also aware of how sensitive this issue of the legitimacy of the court is being seen, and that this that if I say, if I write in my uh, dissent. They are being blind to what's going on in society today, that that strikes right at the heart of that legitimacy. Oh, I think so. I think so. And I think that that's probably why my piece hurt, too, because to say that the court chose to be blind to Sonia Sotomayor's experience as the first Latina justice, I think, uh, strikes at the heart. And so I, I can certainly see that if, you know, the valence around our whole conversation has been, you know, the court is trying to protect this illusion that it's magic and that it's oracular and that it floats in this magic place above politics and ideology in this place of pure 
doctrine and reason discourse. And I think that anyone, and this has always been the case, uh, who calls that into question, I think really does look like they're a villager with a flaming torch. I can certainly see how scary it is. And I think it's really worth pointing out that Justice Breyer is as worried about this as Justice Alito. Justice Kennedy is as worried about this as Justice Sotomayor. Uh, All of the justices fully understand that they are only as safe as the public's conviction that they are a little bit magic. And, you know, I've always joked that for a secular institution, the court is the closest thing we have to a national church, right? Yeah. It's this building that looks like a temple on a mountain and they wear robes and the whole theater of it is that they're magic and they're doing something that, you know, floats above politics. So so I think we have to be aware of how keenly sensitive they are to turns in conversation that suggest that they're not magic and that the emperor has no clothes. Yeah, I'll tell you, Alito even complained, uh, it seemed to me, that he complained that uh, their robes were pretty um, pretty low-key. <laughs> he was talking right. about, I mean, uh, the, the, you the know, Canadians everybody else really... has got much more fanciful robes. But... <laughs> Boy, did the Canadians get whacked in this piece, I have yes. to say. I, can you talk about flaming torches? We're going to see a reprise of the War of 1812 when Canadians come streaming across the border to defend their Santa Claus robes. I find um, it very hard to believe that the Canadians are going to stream uh, this direction across the border, <laughs> frankly. But... Um, <laughs> But Dahlia, thank you so much. I'm sincerely hoping that Alito gets pissed off by this interview and uh, has something to say about it in the future. But um, I, I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for having me.